Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. We're now entering our 10th session. And this session uh, is focused on the remaining uh, rites or religious visits or practices that are legitimately done or maybe encouraged in Medina. And we are continuing from the visit to Medina in general, which we said was recommended, not a part of Hajj, but recommended for those not having easy, easy access to Arabia, to the city, wherein there is the second of the three holy mosques to which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu recommended journey. And we spoke about the fact that the most important characteristic of Medina was it being the home of Hijra, home of emigration. It represented the example for the Ummah until the last day of emigrating from circumstances where Muslims have difficulty practicing the religion to places where they can practice Islam freely or more freely. The concept of Hijra. It is Darul Hijra. It is Medina to Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the city of the messenger, the prophet. But the significance of it is the fact that he made Hijra there. We said in terms of the practices that we do in Medina, most of the practices are focused on Salah. We have an opportunity to make five times daily prayer. There in Medina we should establish it establish it firmly, leave Medina with it in place, and continue it when we return. To build that love for the masjid. Doing it in Medina, obviously, will be much easier. We know there's additional reward. Praying in the masjid of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a thousand times prayer elsewhere. So we're encouraged to go there more regularly. But know that uh, going to prayers in the masjids, in our home circumstance, there is that great reward of being shaded by Allah's throne on the day when there will be no shade. If we become attached to the masjid. So we use that uh, establishment, established prayer in Medina as a springboard to establish this principle back in our lives. Because Allah has prescribed the salah primarily for men in the masjid. That's where they are supposed to pray it, as much as is humanly possible. And we also looked at prayer in Masjid Quba, the first masjid which was built for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu prior to the building of the Mosque of Medina. And we said that this is a masjid worth vi visiting, it's quite nicely uh, done up, a very attractive masjid. You can buy a lot of dates there. They have different varieties of dates that are available there. But particularly what's important about it is that Prophet Muhammad had said that if one makes wudu from one's home and goes there and prays two units of prayer, they get the reward of Umrah. That's two units of accepted prayer. And that is, means that we have to be very meticulous in our prayer because Prophet Muhammad had said sometimes people pray and nothing of the prayer is recorded. Sometimes they pray and only 50% is recorded. And so on and so forth. The degree to which our prayers are accepted is determined by the level of understanding, concentration, and contemplation. 
to what degree our mind is focused. To what degree we understand what we're saying in the prayer itself. And to what degree we reflect on that in ourselves. The more we're able to do that, the greater the reward. The less we're able to do that, the less the reward. <clears throat> the next major masjid which is worth visiting in Medina is known as Masjid al Qiblatain. Masjid al Qiblatain, the mosque of the two Qiblas. The mosque of the two Qiblas. It is authentically reported from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, that when the instruction to change the Qibla from praying to Jerusalem, Muslims in Mecca, Muslims in Medina, the first part of their period in Medina, prayed towards Jerusalem. And this was in unity in Medina, it was in unity with the Jews. Because that was the direction, that's the direction in which the synagogues face. However, when their enmity became most evident, a few of them had accepted Islam, but the majority of them refused. And they became the fifth column, they call them, within the Ummah of Medina, giving support to the enemies of Muslims, even though they had a pact with the Muslims of Medina to not uh, support their enemies against them, but they gave support to the, Jew, to the Quraysh, etc., in their various attacks of Medina until the Prophet ﷺ punished them. The point is that with their final act of treachery, the Qibla was changed. Allah commanded that the Qibla would now be Mecca. From Medina, Jerusalem is north and Mecca is south. So that information when it came to Rasulullah he sent out uh, emissaries across the city to inform Muslims all over that the Qibla had now been changed to Mecca. In one case in Medina they arrived, the emissary arrived at a masjid in which the people were already in Rukur, bowing, facing Jerusalem to the north. And the emissary announced in the masjid, the Qibla has been changed to Mecca. And in the middle of their prayer, they turned to the south. The Imam obviously had to shift his position to now lead them praying towards the south. So this incident is recorded as an example of complete obedience. Instant obedience of the companions of the Prophet And they were the example Prophet Muhammad had said about them, Khairun Nasi Qarni. The best of generations is my generation. So that's how they responded when information came to them correcting anything. They immediately responded to it. They didn't stop and think about it, okay, tomorrow, next prayer, we'll get it right. No, they just corrected it right then and there, immediately. 
And this kind of response is what is really required of us because it's representative of one's faith. The rapidity by which one responds to a command is determined by the faith that one has in the commander. If they believe that commander is God or the messenger of God, then they will act on it immediately. If they believe it's a commander from amongst themselves who didn't necessarily get this from God, it was his opinion, whatever, then they will act on it more slowly. I mean, this is how people are. So, the companions, they demonstrated complete confidence in information which came to them, an immediate response to the prophetic commands. The other examples that they usually give are the examples also of the law concerning alcohol, the drinking of alcohol. And when the verse was revealed, in which Allah described it as rijsun min amal shaitan filth from the work of Satan, and the word spread across Medina with emissaries informing the people, alcohol has been abolished. Allah said, don't even, فَلَا تَقْرَبُوهَا Don't even come near it. When the word spread over Medina, the companion said, the streets of Medina flowed with alcohol. People were sitting in their bars, their drinking uh, dens, and when the command came in, they were drinking, it was Muslims drinking, because it hadn't been prohibited yet, it was discouraged, but still people were drinking. When the command came, people were, had the glass to their mouth, some of them, they described it themselves. They had it to their mouth, about to take the drink. Normally we would just do, okay, put it down. Take the last one before putting it down. But they removed it from their faces, threw it out, and even the vessels that they used, they threw them out too, broke them. This was the way of that early generation. And because of that, Allah gave them success to carry the message of Islam to the four corners of the earth. Now the masjid that is there is an attractive masjid and they do have built in it two qiblas, the main one which people will pray in, but in the opposite direction, which is to Jerusalem, there is a mihrab, but it's not fully done. It's just partially done. You can see the area as if it were the front of an, the masjid. Of course, this is modern architecture. And the actual place, the actual location of the masjid is not known. It's there in Medina, that Masjid Qiblatain. But we don't have historical evidence to confirm that that masjid was actually the masjid or that location was the place where the actual masjid in which that incident took place in Medina took place. Masjid Quba, we're certain. That is the place. But Masjid Qiblatain... And there are many other masters like this, given names. Master the Ramama, where they claim when Prophet ﷺ was walking with his companions, cloud came and sh covered them. Ramama means the cloud. Shaded them from the sun. They have a master there, they call Master the Ramama. They say that's where it took place. Allah knows best. No evidence for it. In any case, there are no special units of prayer to be prayed there. No special reward for prayer there. It's a masjid like any other masjid. If you go in the masjid before you sit down, you make two rakah. That's all. Tahiyatul masjid. It has no special rewards. 
It's just the historical incident that is worth knowing and reflecting on because we have so many examples of it in our own lives where we find out certain things are haram and usually we don't give them up. We find one excuse or another excuse and we continue to do them until eventually we find a, a, you know, a substitute or an alternative that we feel is, is acceptable and then we go on and do it. Or maybe we never find one. We just keep saying we're looking, we're still looking, we're planning, we're hoping. You know, this is the example of what tends to happen in our lives. And of course, it is in contradiction to the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he has clearly advised us وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ That whoever fears Allah is conscious of Allah and gives up what Allah has forbidden then Allah will make a way out for that person. And he will provide from, for him or her from where they didn't expect it, from where they least expected it. That was the example of Hajar and her son, Ismail. She feared Allah. She made her effort. But then Allah brought water for her from where she did not expect it at the feet of her own child and that is the promise of Allah if we believe it then we act in accordance with it the other major area that we are encouraged to visit in Medina it's called, they call it Shuhada Uhud, or the Martyrs of Uhud. It's a graveyard there, wherein those who had lost their lives, Muslims who lost their lives in the Battle of Uhud, are buried. Among them, Hamza. Hamza, uncle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa who Though he was his uncle, he was younger than he was. Though he was his uncle, he was younger than he was. <clears throat> In the Battle of Uhud, we know that Prophet Muhammad had instructed the companions how to prepare themselves for the battle and they engaged very successfully initially in the battle however archers who are placed on a particular mount and when we go to this Shuhada Uhud the mount is still there people go and stand on top of it and we'll probably go there too uh, you can see it relative to Mount Uhud and where the graveyard is. The point is that archers were placed there and the Prophet ﷺ instructed them that they should not move from there. Regardless of what they see happening, they should remain steadfast, covering that position. Because this was protecting the flank of Muslims from a counterattack from their backs. It's protecting the side of the Muslim uh, forces. So while they were in the middle of the battle and they were defeating the pagans, the Quraysh were running, Muslims were winning, and they were dropping their uh, weaponry and things that they had brought with them, the Muslims were collecting them up. Archers saw the 
Quraysh running, saw the Muslims collecting, they said, ah, we've won. We should go and be a part so we don't miss out on getting our share of the booty from the war. And so they started to leave their positions. <clears throat> the person who had been set in charge of the group of archers, he told them, don't go. Prophet Sallallahu said for us to stay. And they argued, and the majority of them went. A few remained back with him, and Khalid bin Walid came around with horsemen, overran that position, killed the archers, and attacked the Muslims from the back side. And the battle, which was going in the favor of the Muslims initially, turned. And a number of Muslims lost their lives, <coughs> including Hamza, uncle of the Prophet. So, <clears throat> those who were killed were buried there. The, the battle ended up sort of neutral. Quraysh didn't win a clear victory. Muslims didn't lose totally, but it was something of a loss for them. And Prophet Muhammad had those who died in the battle buried where they were. They were buried, they could have been taken back to Medina and buried in Medina, but the Prophet Sallallahu instructed that they be buried in the battlefield where they died. And this remains <clears throat> a reminder for us, really till the last day, of the consequence of what happens when we disobey the messenger of Allah. The consequence can be very serious as in this case. A number of Muslims lost their lives as a result of it. Otherwise, we are to obey the messenger. This is an important aspect of our Islam. Whether we have other ideas, other thoughts, the bottom line is we should obey the messenger. He was given instructions by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as such Allah knows best. We should give precedence to what has come to us through revelation over what we might think, we might imagine, we might suppose. So those dead Muslims there remain the uh, focus. Those who go to Medina will go there and make dua for them. There is a location, you will see the graveyard and you see an area where it appears that a grave has been marked off. They say, oh, that's the grave of Hamza, radiallahu anhu, but Allah knows best. But the area which is demarcated as the area for the, of the burial, that is truly the area. Anyway, the issue of visiting graves is something that we should be clear of in Islam. In that the visiting of graves in general is something which was prohibited initially. Prophet Muhammad in the Meccan period had prohibited his, the companions from visiting graves altogether because of the fact that grave worship is one of the main pillars of idolatry and suggested to them to make images at their graves images at their graves and put also these images in statues basically in the other places where they used to sit their majlis in order to remind the people of their way and their goodness this was the intent that's how satan related it to them 
put these things, these were good people. If you, whenever you see these images, these statues, it will remind you of the people and the good that they did. So the people did it. Generations later, when people had now forgotten the reason for putting up these statues in the first place, Satan then came back to the people and told them that your grandparents, your foreparents, used to worship these statues. And it was because of their worship of these statues that they used to have plenty of rain, they had good crops, they had a wonderful harvest, life was good. The people then began to worship, focusing on the graves as well as their majalis, the places where they used to stay. So because of that, because of the fact that so much of idolatry is based in grave worship, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu prohibited going to the grave initially in, in the Meccan period. Later on, he then permitted it. And he said, I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves. Now go and visit them, for they will remind you of the hereafter. For they will remind you of the hereafter. So, on that basis, <clears throat> Prophet ﷺ gave the purpose of visiting graves. The primary purpose was that of reminding one of the hereafter. Another purpose is to pray for the person in the grave. Of course, Prophet Muhammad you know, he had said in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, I asked my Lord's permission to pray for her forgiveness, his mother, and permission was not granted to me. Then I asked his permission to visit her grave, and he permitted me. So visit the graves, for it makes you mindful of death. In the case of somebody who is non-Muslim who dies, you can't pray for them. For a Muslim, you can. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, the prayer of a Muslim for his brother Muslim in his absence will be answered. There is an assigned angel near his head who says, Amin, and may the same be for you, as long as he prays for the good of his brother. So praying for others is good, it is beneficial, and... <clears throat> We can see in our uh, Salat al Janaza where we ask Allah's blessings for those who have passed. And the dua which Prophet said for us to say whenever we go to the graveyard, because Aisha asked him, What should she say if she goes to the graveyard? And he said, Kuli, that is, say, Assalamu ala ahli diyari min al mu'minin wal muslimin. يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ الْمُسْتَقْدِمِينَ مِنَّا وَالْمُسْتَأْخِرِينَ إِنَّا إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَلَاحِقُونَ Peace beyond the believers and the Muslim inhabitants of this city. May Allah have mercy on those who went before us and those coming after. And indeed we will, Allah willing, be joining you. So, this dua indicates we ask for peace, for blessings for those in the grave, just as when we go to visit the grave of Abu Bakr, Omar, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we ask for peace for them. But the main beneficiary of the visiting is the living themselves. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, it makes you mindful of death. That's the main point. It reminds us of the Akhirah. So the visiting of the graveyard in Shuhada Uhud is a reminder to us of the life to come, that our own life is short 
We will be joining them shortly. In another narration it said, Visit the graves because it softens the heart, brings tears to the eyes, and reminds one of the next life. But don't say anything false. And in general, these various hadiths encouraging the visiting of the grave includes both men and women. Um, there is another narration from the Prophet ﷺ in which he said that frequent female visitors to the graveyard is disliked. For a woman to visit the graveyard regularly, frequently, it is not good. She shouldn't do so. But to visit on occasion is perfectly legitimate. And Aisha and wives of the Prophet ﷺ and others used to visit those in the grave, visit the graveyards. And uh, so Sahaba, when they questioned about it, they clarified that this was permission given by the Prophet ﷺ. So it is legitimate for women to also visit the graves. But, as we said, not to do it frequently because they are more emotional. They tend to uh, become more affected. And frequent visiting you know, will increase uh, distress and uh, depression and these kinds of things. So it is preferable that they not go regularly to the graveyards. But occasional visits, as men would also visit, is good to bring tears to the eye, soften the heart, and to remind one of the life to come. And as such, uh, we should also note that we should learn before we go Salatul Janaza. Those of us living here normally, because Salat al Janaza takes place in Abu Hamur, where people are buried, they have a mosque there, and that's where they usually pray Salat al Janaza. It is rare that you will find Salat al Janaza prayed in your local mosque. So it means that most people don't know what it is. And I've been on tour groups before, Islam, Islamic uh, Hajj groups, etc where we've entered into the Masjid of Medina or even in Mecca and we find Salat al Janaza and people are asking, what is this? What is this prayer? What are they doing? They'd never experienced it before. They didn't know what was Salat al Janaza. You know, because it's different. There's no bowing, prostration, etc. So for a person who has never experienced it, it would become something of a shock. Right? So we should learn it because in Mecca and Medina virtually every single prayer will have after it Salatul Janaza. Virtually every single prayer. Right? So it's worth learning how is the Salatul Janaza conducted, being familiar with what you're supposed to say in it, etc. It's not that complicated. Uh, we should try to learn it. Um, in terms of uh, what we can buy from Medina, probably the best thing we can buy is Ajwa dates. Ajwa dates. This is the best thing. Why? Because Prophet Sallallahu had said, من تصبح سبعة مرات عجوة لم يضره ذلك اليوم سم ولا سحر. Any person who takes seven, in some narration, Medinite ajwa dates in the morning will not be harmed by poison or magic for the whole day. This is the statement of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the price for Ajwa dates, naturally, costs more than the regular dates. They may be around 60 to 100 rials per kilo. But it's worth taking some back with us. 
Uh, it's much cheaper there than you'll find it here. And um, use it. Dates are something you can keep for a long time. Use it when you need it. And take benefit from it. So, um, that basically covers all of the points concerning Medina. As I said, <clears throat> in terms of masjids, we have only two. Masjid Quba and Masjid al-Nabawi. The third, Masjid Qiblatain, you may see as a reminder of what it represents, not a masjid that you specifically will go for any specific prayers there because there's no special reward for praying in there. The master that is there, we said, has no historical evidence to confirm the authenticity of its location. And all of the other masjids <clears throat> that you will hear, because you'll have tour guides offering you fancy tours of the ten mosques of Medina. You know, and they tell you things about each one of them. They'll give them names like Masjid Bilal. And, you know, they'll use Masjid Omar and, as a means to make you feel like you've gone into someplace special, but really, they're not authentic. <clears throat> and from Medina, we said, most important uh, point to focus on uh, besides establishing our prayers is to visit the graveyard of Shuhada Uhud to reflect on what happened there remember that battle what it represented what the Shuhada themselves represent in terms of the lives lost due to disobedience to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but as I said, we should keep in mind that going to the graveyard is for ourselves. Something that we should do here in Qatar from time to time. I would venture to say that most of us have never been to the graveyard here in Qatar. We should go there as the Prophet ﷺ recommended it. Recommended for us to go to the graveyard to remind ourselves because <clears throat> it is so easy for us to get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives taking care of the dunya running after the real we get lost we forget that this life is short it will end soon and there is an account that we have to give <clears throat> So to keep focused on the Akhirah, visiting the graveyards is a reminder for us. <clears throat> and as a general tip, as I said, <clears throat> for those of us making Hajj, learn Salatul Janaza as you will need it a lot in Mecca as well as in Medina. So with that, inshallah, we'll uh, <clears throat> stop this session, ending this um, session, the 10th session, a bit early. Uh, we can take some questions. I have a question, some questions online. I'll deal with them first. <clears throat> <clears throat> Is going directly to the haram from Muzdalifah acceptable as per the actual Sunnah? Please clarify. Yes, it is permissible to go from Muzdalifah after midnight directly to the Kaaba to make tawaf there. It was not the order that the Prophet ﷺ did it. The Prophet ﷺ stayed in Muzdalifah, prayed the Fajr, at sunrise, after sunrise, he set out and went into Medina. So he went to Mecca, to Mina. And in Mina, he stoned the Jamarat. 
slaughtered the animal, shaved his head, and then went on to Mecca. However, people came to him on that day, the 10th, and asked him, I did this one before that and that before the other. Is it okay? He said, La Haraj, no problem. People came with all the various scenarios and he just kept saying, No problem, no problem, no problem. So the scholars understood from that that it doesn't matter what order you do it in. He did it in one and it's good, but his permitting it to be done in all of the others is like him doing it in all the others. So it is sunnah to do it one way, as he did it, and sunnah to do it in any of the ways which he approved. So going directly to Mecca is perfectly legitimate. <clears throat> Can we then remove ihram without completing stoning? Yes, it is possible to remove the ihram without completing stoning. If you have made tawaf, and you've shaved your head, then that is sufficient for you to remove the ihram. But we said when you do that, that is called al-tahallul al-awwal, or the first level of coming out of the state of ihram, in which you may do anything and everything that you couldn't do, with the exception of having sexual relations with your wife. Further questions? Hmm? Oh, visiting Ghari Hira. Um, how authentic it is, and that's in Mecca. How authentic it is, Allah knows best. Allah knows best. If you want to go, no harm. But if you're going to go there, don't think you're going to go there and make two rakat. You know, people want to make two rakat every place they go. They think that because this was that, and, and they will have places for you. There will be a place they tell you, this is where the house of the Prophet ﷺ was, his father's house in Mecca. People go there, they make two rakat. I told you about the grave of Eve in Jidda. People going there and making two rakat. You know, they even had a roundabout there in Jidda with a huge bicycle. The wheels were about, you know, 15 feet high, huge wheels. And it was said that this was Adam's bicycle. And you had, unfortunately, some of our brothers from Pakistan coming there and stopping off and making two rakat there. You know, I, I mean, things that you would just think, how in the world could a person, but people are just so much into this two rakat thing, you know, wherever you find something which you think is got special, whatever, and we're going to make two, two rakat for that. So, <clears throat> it, um, uh, there's a note, please pass it. Uh, uh, beware of these. We do this two rak'at where the Prophet ﷺ has instructed it or recommended it. And we uh, don't follow the crowd. The whole idea of this series was to focus on what was essential, what was important for us to understand with regards to the elements of Hajj. When we go to Hajj, we'll find people doing all kinds of things. Because many people, if not most people, go to Hajj not doing what they're supposed to do. So when they get there, they see somebody doing something, they do it. They're just like sheep. You know, everybody going, the sheep go that way, all the, and they go this way, all they go, just that's the way they are. And that's how it is. The important thing is that it is an obligation on each and every one of us to know what constitutes the Hajj before we go there. Not to come back after Hajj, find a sheikh and ask him, should I have done that? Is my Hajj still valid? 
you know, you find all kinds of answers that make you quite unhappy. Maybe your Hajj isn't counted. You have to slaughter an animal and also other kinds of things. No, it is important for us. That's the obligatory knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about when he said, Talabul ilmi farid Allah kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim, is to <clears throat> know and to understand the rites, the rituals, the laws, everything concerning them, when they are obligatory on us. When they are not, then it's not obligatory on you. But once you are now obliged to do this rite of worship, then you better know how to do it. <clears throat> Sorry for asking about Mecca again. No need to be sorry instead of Medina. When we arrive in Mecca, do we have to do Tawaf Qudum immediately or can we first go to sleep if we're tired? Yes, you can go to sleep first, take some rest, get your strength back, and then go and do the Tawaf, the Umrah. Further question? Mm-hmm. Okay, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Okay, this is a fully authenticated hadith. Um, if you want to check it, it's in volume 2, page 463, hadith number 2130. It's also found in Sunan Abi Dawood and Sunan Ibn Majah. But Sahih Muslim is enough. This is one of the most authentic collections of hadith. This hadith is fully authenticated. Abu Huraira related that the Prophet ﷺ visited the grave of his mother and cried and caused those around him to cry. Then he said, I asked my Lord's permission to pray for her forgiveness and permission was not granted to me. Then I asked his permission to visit her grave and he permitted me so visit the graves for it makes you mindful of death of course the implications of this hadith for many ignorant Muslims is something that they can't bear to hear because you know that we are forbidden to pray for those who die disbelievers. We are forbidden to pray for those who die disbelievers. We can go to their grave, but we cannot pray for them because it's confirmed that they're going to hell. For all disbelievers in general, we can't say that, specifically we, because we don't know ultimately their state. But in this case, in the case of Prophet Muhammad when he was prohibited for his mother, then that is affirmation that his mother died a disbeliever. Also, there's another authentic hadith, also found in Sahih Muslim, in which a man came to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, where is my father? And the Prophet ﷺ answered, Your father is in hell. And when the man turned to walk away with tears in his eyes, the Prophet ﷺ called him back and said, He is with my father. So it is authentically established that both the father and the mother of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu died disbelievers and are in hell. But for many Muslims, as I said, because they have been raised with fairy tales about the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu they believe them to be among people in paradise. And they can't bear to hear this. But it is fact. And it is not something that a person needs to feel bad or ashamed about. 
because what happened to the parents of Prophet Abraham? What about his father? He was an idol maker. <laughs> so, what does that mean relative to Prophet Ibrahim? It doesn't affect him. It doesn't make him less of a prophet. So it's not a shame. Some prophets, their fathers or mothers were believers and some weren't. That's just how Allah had it. Further question? Okay, we'll close then. Um, I'd like to thank you all for <clears throat> being with me through the last 10 uh, lectures on the soul of Hajj or a spiritual guide to the rites of Hajj in which we have focused on the inner aspects of the Hajj as distinct from focusing on the ritual details the legal and illegal acts we are focused mostly on what we need to take out of these various acts because Allah has prescribed them for a reason some reason that we are to benefit from and if we are not able to grasp what is the goal of this right and we are only caught up in the ritual itself then we miss out on the Hajj because rituals will not take us to paradise it is sincere intentions it is reflection and understanding and it is within the package of the rituals as prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but most important is that goal is the intent and we said in the very beginning that the Hajj itself was a way or prescribed specifically in order to remember Allah like all of the other pillars of Islam and we quoted the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the tawaf of the house the walking between Safa and Marwa stoning of the pillars was only prescribed in order to establish the remembrance of Allah so that is the goal and that is what we have to keep in mind throughout the Hajj of course different aspects of it brings out other characteristics that one who truly remembers Allah as he deserves to be remembered has to be considered like the ihram we spoke about which brings out the quality of humility it opposes pride it brings man down to the basics humbles him and the woman they are humbled by the state of ihram but that humbling is to enhance the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet sallallahu had said man tawada alillah rafa that whoever humbles himself or herself before Allah Allah elevates them spiritually Allah elevates them so this is the ultimate goal we need to keep in mind and be aware in all of the various rites and rituals of the Hajj what the individual uh, character changing or modifying goals are these are the 
sub goals the main goal being remembrance of Allah but there are sub goals which help us to achieve that remembrance wherein we are blessed with the purification from sin and ultimately paradise as the reward for the accepted Hajj so this is what we have focused on over these last five days in these last ten lectures and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the effort here to share this information with you I ask that he make it reach your hearts and guide you through your Hajj to come whether this year or the years to come inshallah and that you would share this information with your neighbors your friends your family to help awaken the ummah from the state of uh, ignorance and obsession with ritual while at the same time being unconscious of the goals of the rituals. Barakallahu fikum, subhanakallahum wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha ila ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.